I've spent all my life with dance and being a dancer. It's permitting life to use you in a very intense way. Sometimes it's not pleasant. Sometimes it's fearful. But nonetheless, it's inevitable. Martha Graham was one of the great American artists of the 20th century. She changed dance. She invented a new language of movement and used it to reveal the passion, the rage, and the ecstasy common to human experience. She choreographed and danced for 70 years. She was the first dancer ever to perform at the White House. She was the first dancer to receive America's highest civilian award, the Medal of Freedom, and the first to tour abroad as a cultural ambassador. She received every honor, from the key to the city of Paris to Japan's imperial order of the precious crown. Once, a young man attracted by the crowd around her asked for her autograph. She obliged. He thanked her and added, but who are you? She snapped back the piece of paper and said, find out. Her story began in the dark, sooty steel town of Allegheny, Pennsylvania, on May 11, 1894. Martha was Irish and Scottish on one side and descended from Mayflower pilgrims on the other. Her father was an alienist, an early term for psychiatrist, who analyzed people as much by their actions as by their words. Movement never lies, and I'm quoting from him, you will always reveal what you feel in your heart by what you do in your movement. This was my first lesson as a dancer. Martha was the eldest of four. She considered her sisters beautiful, herself plain. In her dream world, she longed to be beautiful and wild. Well, I always wanted to go on the stage. I knew that there was a magic someplace in the world that had to do with a stage. Then I saw the billboard of Ruth St. Dennis. I wanted to go. So my father and mother took me down, and I saw it, and I knew. In the summer of 1916, the awestruck Martha Graham enrolled at the Denishawn School in Los Angeles. The legendary dancer Ruth St. Dennis and her husband Ted Shawn had founded the first professional school of dance in America. Martha wrote, Everyone there has just one great passion, the passion to create beauty. The atmosphere was infectious. But Miss Ruth found the five foot two Martha too short and at the age of 22, too old to become a dancer. Eventually, Ted Shawn saw her talent and took her on tour as his partner. Martha later said of Miss Ruth, she opened a door and I walked into a life. When she was 29, Martha was asked to join the Greenwich Village Follies. The Broadway producer wanted to add class to his show. Martha had been struggling to support her family since her father's death. So when she was offered $350 a week, a fortune in those days, to do her Dennis Shawn dances, she accepted. She was a smash hit, an overnight star. In puritanical Boston, police regularly checked the chorus girls for modesty. Girls would have to wear little shirts or something underneath because their skin showed. So they 
girls were furious and they put them on and I was standing there waiting my turn. And one man will said, so, well, what about her? And a great big burly policeman said, no, she doesn't have to, she's art. The showgirls were jealous of her popularity and called her the princess. But she knew she wanted something more. Martha Graham wrote these notes when she was in her 20s. I wonder if I will ever be great enough to have interesting memories. I can take care of the success part, but it takes the gods to make me great, I suppose. Abandoning her security, she moved to New York in 1925 rented a small studio at Carnegie Hall and began her life's work. I don't feel I had any choice. I wanted, and because I wanted, I did. She equated art with religion. And I think she thought she or anyone who was able to do this was possessed in a little bit by God. Martha was a real genius. And she was, of course, madly in love with Martha and Martha's ideas and Martha's purposes. I, I'm sure she felt that she was the chosen one. <laughs> she felt that uh, by divine grace, she'd been given this tremendous power, which she had. Martha Graham wrote in her notebooks, that driving force of God that plunges through me is what I live for. Louis Horst, pianist and composer, followed Martha to New York. They had met and fallen in love when he was music director at Dennis Shawn. He had been bowled over by Martha's blazing intensity. I am her wall, Louis said. An artist needs something to lean against. He would remain at her side for more than 20 years as mentor, lover, composer, and taskmaster. Louis constantly pushed Martha to do more, to be more. I remember once here in New York, I showed him a dance. He said, Martha, it's awful. I said, but Louis, you're killing my soul. He said, if it is going to die, it's best to die now. He urged her to risk a concert in a Broadway theater, no less. They borrowed $1,000 and with a trio of dancers premiered 18 short works. Martha dances as a Greek figurine come to life. And of course, they were very derivative, those dancers. They couldn't be anything else. Some of them are pretty awful. Just dreadful. And then I began talking to Martha. I said, there are new things happening. I said, you've got to start now getting away from your Dennis Sean work. She said, well, I'm trying new exercises. We'd talk and we'd rehearse. Louis read her his translations of German philosophy and showed her abstract paintings by his friend Kandinsky. I had never seen any modern painting. I had never seen any modern art of any kind. I had almost died with sheer excitement. He introduced her to ultra-modern music, teaching that dance should come first and music second. Don't follow the music, he said. You are the music. In the late 1920s, dance could be found in the Broadway musical, vaudeville skits, minstrel shows, 
and ballroom exhibitions. To most Americans, serious dance meant ballet from Europe. Ruth's and Dennis' exoticisms, the Greek interpretations of Isadora Duncan and her Isadora Bells. Martha spoke an entirely different language, protesting, stark, and American. of Puritans confront an outcast. Martha struggles against them. Some found the work ugly and hateful. Others called it a revolutionary masterpiece. Martha wrote we are all of us unique. Each a unique pattern of creativity, and if we do not fulfill it, it is lost for all time. She broke custom. She broke through barriers. She presented new ideas. She had ambitions for herself that were inhuman. That you must never compromise, that you must never give way, ever. you know, you experiment with movement until you find some little secret language which speaks for your body and for your, your heart. The movement gives you back very often the meaning. You don't start, I will express anger or I will express grief. You move in such a way that it gives you back anger or grief, so that you have your roots very far in fundamentals. The technique itself is her major contribution uh, to the 20th century. You may or may not like her work, but you have to recognize that she uh, rediscovered or invented a way of moving that uh, became the only other codified dance technique outside of classical ballet to endure. Martha's dancing, the impulse, starts with a show of effort. And she made everything start with what she called a contraction, which really was a thrust in the pelvis. And it was animal, and it was strong, and it was direct and candid. Movements came just stark out of the body as though it had never happened before.
I do think the human body is very, very beautiful and very eloquent. And it's uh, to be treasured and honored and disciplined. And that's a dancer's life. I think one of the things that fascinated me the most about Martha Graham was that the theater community was at her feet, and I love that. She wasn't just some lady off in some studio making up dances that would change the world. She was part of a performing community. Martha's reputation as a teacher grew. Broadway and Hollywood actors came to work with her, not to dance, but to learn how to move, how to connect the body with the emotions, the mind with the spirit. My first film uh, was called So Young, So Bad, and I played a, a disturbed young woman in the film, a kid. I had to look through a window, see this friend of mine hold a baby, and I turn into camera and break into tears. Well, I thought, I don't know how to do that. So what I did was I did a contraction, a Martha Graham contraction, you know, that gut thing, and I just sank and just sobbed. If you try to cry, it's difficult. But if you're playing the emotion and the situation, which is what Martha said, you're playing the situation and the circumstances, that that'll flow. It'll flow out of you. In 1930, Martha premiered Lamentation, a dance of mourning. In this rare footage, she stretches inside her costume as if it were her own skin. Here was somebody who could manifest, make visible all those feelings you have inside you that you can't put words to. She seemed to have all the connections that so-called normal people, us, or me, for instance, speaking for myself, don't really have. The connections between emotion and movement and memory and intuition all direct. There's no shortcut. There was no pretense in a way. Throughout the Depression years, Martha toured America with Louis and her company. She had first crossed the continent at 14 when her father moved the family from Pennsylvania to California. The journey stayed with her all her life. She transformed her reawakened images of the prairies into frontier. The girl 
is seeing a great landscape, untrammeled. It's very different from anything that is Puritan. It's not puritanical at all. It's the appetite for space, which is one of the characteristics of America. It's one of the things that has made us pioneers. When I present something on the stage with music and with costumes and with settings, I expect those to be part of the drama, not a decoration. For the setting, Martha turned not to a scene painter, but to a sculptor, Isamu Noguchi. The fence marks the border of the woman's land. His rope stretched to infinity, suggesting vast, empty space. Noguchi designed 22 productions for Martha in one of the most fruitful collaborations of her career. Together, they changed the face of dance theater. Isamu, she said, could always read my mind and trigger my visions. Martha Graham was a woman whose style was larger than life even when she was off stage, and certainly when she was on, she never stopped projecting. I think she took her face and made a mask of it that could telegraph all the way to the top row of a theater. She was glamorous. Who was basically more glamorous? Look at those early photographs. I'm arrogant and I'm vain, and I don't mind admitting those things because I know they're true. Martha's fame was growing. Vanity Fair contrasted Sally Rand, the nude fan dancer, with Martha, the serious artiste. The New Yorker published a profile of her. So they asked me what I thought was the center of the stage. And I said, well, the center of the stage is where I am. That's not for Santa Claus. First, for me. The ultimate in fame came when Martha was a mystery guest on a wildly popular radio show, Truth or Consequences. To all of you who have written and telephoned and wired asking me if I was Miss Hush, the answer is yes, I am Martha Graham. Uh, that indeed uh, helped make her a household name. I mean, people used to go go to the theatre to, to, to see Miss Hush. Not oh, my mother hated it, but she capitalised on it. She had to be fashionable. She had to be on everyone's lips. It was essential for her to get the large sums of money she needed to create. Her work became bolder, her group of dancers larger. The gathering storm in Europe intensified Martha's social consciousness. It was the decade of Charles Chaplin's Modern Times and Picasso's Guernica. remained a constant in Martha's life. He wrote music for her and rehearsed her dances. He was her anchor. Whenever Martha did a work, Louis was called in. When she was halfway finished, when, whenever she uh, did not know how to proceed the next day. And we danced what we had learned from Martha about this new work, sometimes over and over again, so that he could see it and help her. And he would make her stay there. Food would be sent in until she finished her work. 
This took its toll on Louis, and there were often clashes between them. Martha was volatile. She was not in the habit of civilizing herself. Martha could hit, slap, and she was not going to curb her reactions because out of those reactions came dance movement. Martha d didn't behave very well. I mean, she had temperament during rehearsals. And once on stage, she had a tantrum. And, and the girls were in hysterics. They were about, the curtain was about to go up. And Louis simply went up to her and slapped her right across the chops. Bang! Said, get on with this, you bitch. Stop your nonsense. Louis saw me through so much. If someone believes in you that much, you have to submit. You fight against it, but you take it. In the summer of 1936, Martha and her company were in residency at Bennington, an innovative college in Vermont. There, Eric Hawkins entered her life. A Kansas-bred boy and a graduate in Greek studies from Harvard, he was already a soloist in Balanchine's ballet caravan. I knew when I saw Frontier that a genius was at work. And that's why I went up to Bennington to study with her. I did have an imagination, and I was very musical. We had a wonderful conversation about art. Uh, when Eric came, first of all, he came from a strictly ba ballet background. And Martha put him in charge of the first rehearsals at Bennington. Eric would say, now you should have your arms where Ethel has, and they should be at this and this angle. Well, we thought, this is outrageous. This guy, he doesn't know what Martha's about. We never were told our arms. He was such a pain in the neck. Our arms were where our backs put them, and that's where they should be. He didn't know what he was doing. So there was a lot of jealousy. You know, it was that into our sacred circle came a foreign element. And it obviously was the element that Martha preferred. He was her darling. The girls called Eric the torso. And when Martha started to choreograph for him, some of her best dancers quit. But Martha was in love. Completely and utterly in love. Martha Graham was 44. Eric Hawkins, 29. Martha's dance language changed. It always starts with some mood, some feeling, some intensity of life, which I want to participate in as a dancer. Eric had a strength, and against Eric, she could be feminine and lovely and beautiful. She was very much in love with Eric Hawkins at the time. That, and all that was part of her dance life as well.
happiness turned into laughter and the comedic satire, Every Soul is a Circus. Here, she plays an empress dominating the circus. She flirts with an acrobat danced by Merce Cunningham. The ringmaster, Eric, takes her back. Martha spoke of one tender moment in the dance. Just before I tapped Eric with the flower, I thought, where do you come from? Oh, I could eat you up. Love in Martha's life culminated in her most lyrical and most popular work, a simple portrait of a Quaker marriage. Appalachian Spring is the story of a young married couple who are coming into their home for the first time. Here, Martha, age 65, recreates her role as the bride, dancing with Stuart Hodes as a young husband man, the role she originally created for Eric. Eric was managing the company. Eric was also Martha's partner. Eric was trying desperately to find funds for Martha and wanted some authority. Didn't want to feel as though he was beholden to Louis' decisions. And for the last three, four years, I was always thinking about quitting. I was flirting with the idea but I've gotten a little feeling, well, what will I do without Martha, you know? They began to quarrel openly. More and more, Martha took Eric's side against Louis in front of the company. I got disgusted with her, and uh, I said, I'm resigning, and you can take my two weeks' notice, and I said, I just have to leave. Martha was stunned at losing Louis after 22 years of friendship and creative collaboration. Two weeks later, in Santa Fe, Eric convinced Martha to marry him. She was 54, he 39. Well, you couldn't warn Martha, you couldn't say anything to her, but all her friends were very worried indeed. And she walked straight into the trap that great gifted women are apt to walk into when they fall in love. The man can't stand the inferior position. To keep from being totally overpowered, Eric urged her to mine his field, the Greek classics.
The Princess of Crete, Ariadne, enters the labyrinth and is confronted by the half-man, half-beast Minotaur. This dance has a special significance for me because it was a conquering of fear in my own life. Fear of the unknown, fear of something not recognizable. She lived out a lot of her personal needs in her work. They related definitely to Martha's interior. And she had this incredible ability to tap that and fearlessly find a movement language to reflect it. That was what was extraordinary. She was not afraid of this monstrous side of herself. Uh, and on the stage, she formalized it and made it into these amazing movement images. Because after all, what you do dance is the state of a man's being. And of course, sometimes it happens to be about a subject we don't like to recognize in ourselves. Martha created her own version of Euripides Medea. Consumed by hatred towards her faithless husband, Medea devours her own entrails. Well, Martha approached everything in her life psychologically. Martha thought that to be an artist, she could indulge in her private emotional storms. of art to show the psychology was something I wanted to avoid. If she had just gone on the way she had done uh, in some of her early works, uh, they were life-giving and, uh, and they were glorious. I could see that uh, he was as eager to do his creative work as he was to be in her creative work. And since they were partners, um, he had the privilege of, of doing that, and she let him do it. For the summer of 1950, Eric arranged a tour to Paris and London, where he hoped to escape being Mr. Martha Graham. It was uh, the opening night right in the middle of a dance I was doing with Martha, I saw her, her pain. So late the next day, the knee was swelled up twice the size. 
We went to several doctors there. Well, I knew Martha couldn't, couldn't dance on that. She had to go down on her knee. But I said, you can't dance. Let's cancel the performances. She went into a fit. The torn cartilage in her knee forced them to cancel the tour. I don't think Martha ever understood that I made a decision for her sake to protect her. In London, Eric left her and returned home alone. Martha said, I was no longer useful to him. Our differences were just too much. So by that time, I, I knew I wanted to, to tr go out on myself and try my own ideas. Well, I was with Martha for 12 years. It was very wonderful. And I guess I'd say I loved her. Martha retreated to the southwest. She wrote her dearest friend, a Jungian analyst, Mrs. Frances Wicks. Dear lady, I've come to know that I love Eric so much. No place matters without him. I understand the increasingness of despair. Martha found comfort in her work and fought her way back. She returned with a large-scale composition based on the myth of Joan of Arc. Martha identified with St. Joan as a heroic woman of vision and of action. Martha wrote, she is forever the symbol of the triumph over the oblivion that is death. Her triumph is the one triumph, the deathlessness of vision. Martha's life was her work. There was no other life. Martha didn't have time to develop close friendships. That takes time and energy. She didn't have it. She was, to me, like a Navajo woman sitting on a plateau in the Southwest, quietly weaving and deep in her own life her inner thoughts. She had a vision of what she was to do, which was a blessing for her. And she, it animated her into life, but she kept spots and places of her completely private. No one would ever understand them. And that was not rejecting anyone. It was not remoteness. It was just a, as she was.
Dance was it all the time. She went away to think about dance to come back to do it. She lived at the studio. There was nothing else in her life. If you weren't in the studio, she didn't love you. <laughs> At 64, Martha astounded the dance world with her dark and complex Clytemnestra, a three-act dance drama based on Aeschylus Oresteia. Clytemnestra and her lover plot to kill her husband. When Anthony Tudor, the English choreographer, asked her, how do you want to be remembered, as a dancer or a choreographer? Martha answered, as a dancer, of course. Tudor looked at her and said, I pity you. Martha was slowly being crippled by arthritis in both her hands and her feet. When she was 74, in Acrobats of God. Martha Graham plays herself as a choreographer fussing while a rehearsal director supervises the dancers. Martha very, very seriously was coming to grips with the fact of whether she could dance anymore, whether she could be on stage. She had to know that she was dancing a little too long and that it wasn't great. She'd do odd things on stage, get her hand right in your face sometimes. And there were surprises that she didn't want. Martha Graham wrote in her notebooks, at moments I think that it is time for me to stop. I think of Malamé's image of the swan who stayed too long in the winter water until the ice closed around his feet and he was caught. I wonder sometimes if I have stayed too long. But she began to doubt her body as she got older. She would start to drink, and sometimes too much, so that she would lose control. In those days, in the beginning, there was never a hair out of place. And if she were rehearsing and something would come down into the dressing room, she'd come back just absolutely immaculate. And towards the end, it was very difficult to rehearse because she would come so drunk. The hardest thing for her, more than any choreographer, was not to relinquish dancing, but to sit in the wings and watch young people made up to look like her dancing with a man looking like Eric in a dance she loved doing, and, and she's, she's sitting there, torture. Uh, 
I did one run through in the studio and she said it will be fine. She could not bring herself to work in the piece with somebody else dancing it. And the day of my performance in New York, she said, you must know that this is the worst day of my life. When she could no longer dance, she wanted to die. She felt her necessity was gone. She drank very heavily, and it got worse and worse and worse. And I was told by Gert Macy, who was her manager, I said something about Martha. She said, you better hurry up and see her. She's not going to last long. She's dying of alcoholism. Martha said, I know that the anonymity of death has no appeal for me. It is the now that I must face. What is there for me but to go on? That is life for me. I think the reason Martha stopped drinking and came back to work was she felt a tremendous responsibility. She felt the responsibility to attempt to see if her legacy could continue. She knew if she didn't, it would be gone. On her return to work at the age of 79, she created over 20 new ballets and 30 major revivals. Students came from every corner of the world to study. The great dancers of our time came to learn her dances. I received so much from the world, good things and bad things, and I've had people to work with over a period of years who I treasure. It is my debt, and in a way, it's, as Emily Dickinson said, this is my letter to the world. Mm -hmm. 